Hello, I'm Adam Hart Davis, and this is how Britain was built. I'm about to visit an ancient harbour city that pioneered transatlantic trade and is home to some phenomenal pieces of Victorian engineering. the River Avon and the Port of Bristol. From here, John Cabot set off to cross the Atlantic and discovered America. 500 years ago, it was one of the busiest harbors in Britain. This city is based on trade and commerce and venture. Bristol is a city of invention and discovery, whose history is bound up with the Atlantic and beyond. It was Bristol's merchants who financed the voyage that discovered America. They were to reap the rewards for centuries after. It took Cabot nearly two months to reach America. 500 years later, Bristol was at the forefront of another landmark crossing of the Atlantic. This time, it took just three hours. The world's first transatlantic liners were built here. The world's most famous engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, launched the first ocean-going propeller-driven ship here, the SS Great Britain. It was just one of his creations. Before Brunel, no one believed you could bridge a gap like the Avon Gorge with such an elegant span. And Bristol was the destination of his Great Western Railway, one of the amazing engineering feats of the 19th century. Industry, science and technology are everywhere to be seen in a city where old and new sit side by side. A city that always has been and still is ready to face the challenge of the future. In Saxon times, Bristol was known as Brig Stow, the place by the bridge, and it was here that a small port had been established. Located on Britain's west coast, Bristol was in an ideal position for medieval trade. Ireland is just to the west, and Europe and the Mediterranean to the south. The port was run by the Society of Merchant Venturers, men who were prepared to risk the perils of the high seas in return for the great rewards of trade with other lands. Bristol's prosperity was built on the export of wool and the import of fortified wine, even then known as Bristol Cream, like the sherry still sold today. Only London handled more trade. As well as carrying goods from this harbour, men set out for the fishing grounds of the northwest Atlantic. And it wasn't just fishermen. At the end of the 15th century, half the world was still uncharted. But an epic voyage beginning in Bristol was about to change all that as men sought a quicker route to the east by going west. In 1497, John Cabot set sail in search of new lands and an alternative route to the east with its valuable spices and silks. His ship was the Matthew and this is a modern reproduction of the Matthew. Cabot was a brilliant sailor. He came from Genoa, and his real name was Giovanni Caboto, but it's been anglicised to John Cabot. Some of the money for the trip came from a chap called Richard Amorike, and it's possible that the name America comes from Amorike. But I prefer the story that after weeks and weeks of horrendous voyage, the chap in the crow's nest shouted out, Land ho! And a Bristolian down on deck said, Oh, it's a miracle! It's a miracle! And that's how it became America. Anyway, the fact is that John Cabot was the first person to set foot on North America. He got there before Christopher Columbus. Bristol was an ideal base for Cabot. Its sailors knew the Atlantic better than any others. Some had even been on voyages to try and find the mythical island of High Brazil. More importantly, its shipbuilders could build vessels sturdy enough to cope with terrifying Atlantic storms. Still, the Matthew is only 83 feet long, small even by the standards of the time. And I certainly wouldn't like the idea of sailing across the Atlantic in her. In 1997, a crew did just that, 
18 brave souls sailed the same route as Cabot from Bristol to Newfoundland to celebrate the 500th anniversary. And one of the people on that trip was Martin Pick. Martin, was it uncomfortable? At times, it had its moments, of course. <laughs> but, um, it's, yeah, like I say, a small vessel like this in um, pretty mountainous seas at times, uh, it did get uncomfortable. We had a, a Force 11 storm. Uh, just, Force 11? Yeah, Force 11. Wow. 63 knots of wind was recorded. And, um, yeah, the, the s size of the swell, we're talking 50 to 55 foot, which is just slightly below the crow's nest level there. <laughs> so, rather, rather you than me. Cabot's great legacy to Bristol was a route to America, an unknown land, a whole new continent to be colonised and traded with. For 300 years, Bristol had a virtual monopoly on trade with America. All of its great buildings were built on the profits from the route pioneered by Cabot. What reward did Cabot get for finding America? Well, they gave him a pension of £20 a year and, and a lump sum of £10. Actually, that wasn't so bad. It was worth a lot of money in those days. With £10, Cabot could have bought himself a ready-made suit of armour, paid for his funeral, or rented a merchant's house for a year or two. 400 years later, this tower was erected high above Bristol in recognition of his great achievement. And the figure on the top represents, what else? Commerce! Down in the harbour, there's a statue of the great man. Actually, probably a bit greater than he was in real life, since sitting down, he's as tall as I am standing up. He's looking rather gaunt and worried, I would say, about the great voyage to come. From here, you can see the spire of St Mary Redcliffe, the parish church, where I expect all the sailors went to pray before they set off. When he came back, Cabot presented the church with a whalebone to thank God for his safe passage. The church has one special claim to fame. In 1547, Queen Elizabeth I came here and said that St Mary's was the fairest, goodliest and most famous parish church in England. It certainly does seem more like a cathedral than a parish church, though parish church is what it is. Its grandest tomb belongs to William Cannings, not a noble or a priest, but fittingly for this harbourside church, a merchant. Just look at this, it's wonderful. Mr William Cannings, the richest merchant of the town of Bristol afterwards chosen five times mayor of the said town. Isn't that terrific to claim in the church that you're the richest man in town? The harbour had given Bristol its wealth, but at the end of the 18th century, it was beginning to lose trade to other ports. The reason was simple. Putting it right was not. This is the River Avon, which runs right through the middle of Bristol, out under the suspension bridge to the sea, about 10 miles away. It's a tidal river, which means it goes up and down with the tides. And now it's almost exactly high tide. You can see that the water can't quite decide whether to come in or to go out. So I'm going to plant a flag here on the edge of the water at high tide and we'll come back in six hours and see how far the water has gone down. Now it's just about low tide and see how far the water's gone down. That's 13 metres, 40 feet. There's only one place in the world that has a greater tidal range and that's the Bay of Fundy in Canada. Imagine what would have happened if a ship had come in and tied up to the bank here at high tide. The water drops away and the ship's going to fall over disaster if she falls that way, but bad enough to fall into the bank. In fact, a ship with old creaking timbers might have fallen apart. And that's one possible origin of the expression all ship shape and Bristol fashion. The ship's got to be tough enough to withstand the rigours of tying up on the river in Bristol. But there is a simpler alternative, which is that all the stuff on board would have collapsed and fallen on the floor unless it was really well stowed away and lashed down. So, one way or the other, all shipshape and Bristol fashion. I have to say I'm glad I didn't tie up here at high tide. So, at the beginning of the 19th century, Bristol's harbour was losing trade. 
Ship owners didn't want the trouble of mooring at Bristol's quayside. Something had to be done. In 1803, the Bristol Docks Company was established and it came up with a solution. Since then, Bristol's harbour has always been known as the Floating Harbour, which I have to confess I don't quite understand. The curator of industrial history here in Bristol is Andy King. Andy, what did they do? Well, in the old days, the River Avon came in from the sea, from here, run round the corner, right the way through the centre of Bristol and out towards Bath. In order to keep all the traditional heart of the harbour, they decided to impound all of this river by putting a dam in here, where we are at the moment, and another one all the way inland at Netham, and built what they prosaically call the New Cut, which is a ditch, effectively, <laughs> to take all the tidal water away from the harbour, right the way up through to Netham Weir and occasionally above it. And so there's a huge lock here, that, so it keeps all the water in at high tide level? That's right, yes. Right. And it's called the Floating Harbour, which I always find very confusing, because it doesn't float, does yep. it? It's called the Floating Harbour simply because the ships in it stay afloat, whereas previously they didn't. They all had to lie on the mud beforehand. Yep, indeed. Right. I begin to understand. Thank you very much. This is where the old river used to go, and these lock gates are what keep the water level high in the floating harbour. Now, if you come across here, you can see this is the new cut, which is effectively the river now. And you'll see the water coming, belting down here and zooming down with the tide and the current out under the suspension bridge to the sea. Redirecting the river was nothing new. Right back in the 13th century, a stretch of it had been straightened at a cost equal to hundreds of millions of pounds today. The massive engineering work of the 19th century gave Bristol a new lease of life. The port was no longer tidal, so ships could be loaded and unloaded at any time with no risk of grounding. New warehouses were built on the quayside. The floating harbour here made things much safer for the ships, at least while they were in port. But for the sailors out at sea, life was still pretty tough. Imagine a greedy ship owner. He's got a lot of cargo in his ship, but he wants to put in a lot more. He wants to take a massive amount across the ocean and make himself a fortune. So he sets off to sea, or rather he makes his sailors set off to sea, loaded to the gunnels like that. And it's all right in harbour, but a little bit of wave action and the whole thing sinks and all those sailors would be drowned. Well, along comes a local hero, born in Bristol, Samuel Plimpsell. He became an MP and he forced through Parliament a bill to make sure that ship owners could only load the ship until the water line was here. This is the Plimpsell line, named after him. So now let's try again. I've taken some of the cargo out. Just issues, just deepen the plimsoll line. I'll take a bit more cargo out, as the ship owner would have to. And there we are, the water level is just on the plimsoll line, and now, even in a rough sea, the boat stays afloat, and all those sailors' lives would be saved. Thousands and thousands of sailors owed their lives to Samuel Plimsoll. Before Plimsoll, unscrupulous ship owners had made money at the expense of the lives of others, and it wasn't just sailors. Part of Bristol's success was built on a very unsavoury trade, a trade in human cargo. Just how rich Bristol had become in the 17th and 18th centuries can still be seen in the grand architecture of the old city centre. The Corn Exchange dates from 1741. Before the Corn Exchange was built, the merchants and traders would do their deals here in the street, usually standing one either side of these iron pillars known as nails. And when they'd agreed the price, the chap who was buying would pay on the nail. And that's where the expression comes from. As well as grand public buildings, Bristol's affluent citizens were building themselves fine homes. This is Queen's Square. After years of neglect, it's recently been returned to its full Georgian splendour. Trade made Bristol and its merchants rich, but much of the wealth 
came from the profits of trading human cargo. I'm on my way to see where Bristol's most famous slave and his owner lived. This house was built for a man called John Pinney in 1790. It's been perfectly restored to show how a wealthy Bristol merchant lived in the 18th century. Pinney inherited a sugar plantation on the Caribbean island of Nevis and ran a sugar importing business here in Bristol. The way they got their sugar was relatively simple. Out in the Caribbean, they grew sugarcane, and this is sugarcane straight off the plantation. Um, mm, it's deliciously sweet, very sort of fibrous. And they crushed this up, and the crushing process delivered two products. First, molasses, that's this stuff. It's thick and dark, it's like black treacle, but very, very sweet. And also, crude sugar, here it is, it's like brown sugar, but it's a little bit sticky and full of impurities. And this was the stuff that was shipped back to England. And here in England, it was refined, and they refined it by boiling it up with chalk and by filtering it through bits of old bones. And it came out lovely and white and clean and ready for the table. And actually, posh people didn't buy it in bags looking like this. They bought sugar cones. And in fact, there's an original one in the larder there. The curator of the Georgian house is Karen Walton. Karen, this is a wonderful room. This is the main sitting room, is it? This is the main drawing room, yes. Right, the drawing room, withdrawing after dinner. Right. Yes, and, and facing south and all the lights streaming in. South facing, and of course, in the 18th century, you'd have had a wonderful view of the river and the docks. Karen, I see the dining room is set for pudding. Dessert. Uh, oh, sorry, dessert. <laughs> were, were, they, were they keen on their desserts? Oh, yes, they were. Um, by the late 18th century, obviously, they got used to sugar. They had very oh, yes. Food. Oh, yes. Apart from their desserts, what else did they eat? There would have been another two courses, yes. The first and second courses were quite similar. They were called removes. Um, and they had a variety of dishes. So there would have been meat dishes and um, little vegetable dishes at the corners. Uh, and the first course would have been um, different from the second one in that it had soup. So you'd have had soup at one end of the table. But with meat as well? But there would have been meats and things on the table. And, and did you just, did you pass the things around? And... No, uh, there are wonderful stories about how um, you only ate what was near you. So if you fancied something the other end of the table, that was, you oh, it was very, awful. very sad. Terribly <laughs> tempting. So if your least favourite aunt came, you could make her favourite dish and put it oh, just out of reach. Out of reach. Oh. And were the servants waiting all the time? Probably not. The usual thing was that they would come in, set it up, and then leave the room, because if you had the servants hanging around, it rather restricted your conversation. Uh, yes, I can imagine it would, yes. These days, we might perhaps wonder how John Pinney managed to sleep in bed at night, because his wealth, like that of most people in Bristol, and indeed many people across the country, his wealth was tainted with the terrible practice of slavery. Around 200 slaves were needed to run his plantation on Nevis. In the four years between 1765 and 1769, he bought 66 slaves. The trade was known as the triangular trade. First, manufactured goods were shipped from Europe to Africa. They were exchanged for slaves who were then transported to the colonies across the Atlantic. The slaves were traded for raw materials like sugar, cotton, chocolate and tobacco, which in turn were brought back to Europe's ports. Karen, I gather that some slaves were quite well treated, is that right? Very few, um, but it does seem that John Pinney and his family became quite attached to Perrault, who, um, who was a slave but who uh, came back to England with the Pinney family and became John Pinney's sort of personal servant. So he was almost a servant? Then. Yes, he was. Uh, when you say they were attached to him... What? Well, um, we know certainly at the end of his life, um, Perrault was ill and um, the family looked after him, sent him out to the country and um, visited him there. Oh, really? Yes. Ah, well, that's rather touching, isn't it? Is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but that was, that was rare. That's very rare. John Cabot had to wait 400 years for his tower. At least Perrault got his recognition a little bit quicker. 
They built this bridge and they named it after him only 200 years after he died. In fact, slavery was behind most of the trade and the industry which made Bristol rich. In the 1670s, around half of Bristol's ships were engaged in transporting tobacco from plantations in the colonies. Wills set up in Redcliffe Street to process it. It was to become the first British company to issue cigarette cards. Chocolate making was also dependent on slave labour for its raw material. Fry's was the biggest chocolate maker in the country and was the first to introduce the idea of eating chocolate rather than drinking it. Of course, not all Bristol's industry had its origins in the slave trade. Wine importing and brewing, for example. Bristol Cream Sherry became a household name. And glass making. In the 18th century, it was Bristol's biggest manufacturing industry. 50% of all bottles and windows in England were said to originate here. The distinctive conical glass houses where it was made could be seen all across the city. This is the rather stunted remains of the last one. As well as window glass, they make this, Bristol Blue. Local merchants prized it as a way of showing their wealth. But soon it was being made in lots of different places, and glassmaking all but disappeared from Bristol. Till now. This piece was made a few days ago. And this is the original. It was made about 1810, and it's actually signed on the bottom... Isaac Jacobs. So we know it was made in Bristol and it's being looked after by Bristol Blue Glass who are doing their best to put Bristol back on the glass making map. It's called Bristol Blue because the cobalt that gives it its colour was originally imported through Bristol. They've rashly said I can have a go at making a piece myself. James, I gather you've drawn the short straw. I believe so. Um, OK, can we make a beaker? Yes. OK, how do we start? OK, what we're going to do is we're going to get a piece of glass out the furnace. Yes. Sit down in the bench yeah. and begin to shape it. Right, sitting in the bench. I'm going to help you turn it. Yeah, thank you. A little bit of water on that paper pad. Here? Yeah. Water. This is paper. This is newspaper. Right. OK, so as we're rolling down the bench, yeah. we're just using the paper just to round up the edges. Like that. OK, hand off. If I get it hot again, we're now going to start blowing it up. OK. Right, if I keep it turning. Right. Nice and steady. There we go. OK. Cool. Like that? Yeah. Oh, hey, I made, I changed the shape. Yeah. And this time using the graphite paddle, we're just going to start to flatten, flatten the, the bottom end. off. OK. OK, nice and gently right. running that again. Straight the against the bottom. Not too hard. OK, what we're going to do now, we're actually going to get another iron with another right. piece of glass on the end. Right. We're going to stick it to the bottom of this piece. OK. This is known as a ponte or punting. Right. Um, get the straw around the top. Keep it there. All right. So we've got to pull out the, the lip now, haven't we? Yeah. With one piece or two? With, with two. So we're coming right. right in this way. Right. right. And just gradually, not, not too hard, just gradually opening them up. We're actually running across oh. that top edge. It'd be better if I was doing it evenly, wouldn't it? <laughs> We're going to heat up the very top. Right. We're just going to use the back of the tools to, to pull two inside. little lips. Okay. Just to flick two little lips in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice right. and gentle. So this can be anywhere, can't it? Yep. There. On that side. Like that. And then on the other side. There. How's that? I could claim that I had made this, but it wouldn't be true. However, I did have a small hand in it, and I haven't broken it yet. Of all the glassmakers in Bristol, Isaac Jacobs was the most celebrated and the first ever to sign his glass. But he had a much more famous contemporary, a great engineer who was to leave his signature on the city itself. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, a world-famous engineer and a man who left his mark on Bristol like no other. 
He first came here in 1828 after a catastrophic accident in the Rotherhithe Tunnel. There was a flood and he was pulled unconscious from the water and he came to Bristol to recover. He stayed in Clifton. In the 19th century, this was a new suburb full of grand residences and elegant terraces. Many were owned by Bristol's now rich merchants who'd moved away from the docks that had made them rich. This one belonged to the Pinney family, who despite the abolition of slavery had managed to become even richer. Clifton sat at the top of the Avon Gorge and if you wanted to cross the river, you had to go all the way down and up the other side. To be honest, there wasn't much reason to go across. There was very little there back then, and there's not a lot now. Nevertheless, a wealthy Bristolian left a thousand pounds in his will to be invested until it had grown sufficiently to pay for a bridge across the gorge. Grandiose plans were put forward, none more so than this. Of course, the eventual result was Bristol's world-famous landmark, Brunel's Clifton Suspension Bridge. I say eventually because it was completed only in 1864, more than a hundred years after the original legacy and five years after Brunel's death. In 1829, the great engineer and bridge builder Thomas Telford was asked to take charge of a design competition for a bridge across the gorge. He dismissed all the entries, including four from Brunel. Brunel's designs were for a single span, but Telford believed the distance was too great. He submitted a design of his own, this one, with two massive towers beside the river and three sections in all. It was derided by the public, and in 1831, one of Brunel's entries was accepted. Why did he build a suspension bridge? Let me show you. Here is the road coming up from Clifton and here is the road going away in Lee Woods. And I need to bridge that gap. And you have to imagine that this chasm is 250 feet deep. So I get a piece of timber which mercifully will just go across the gap like that. And then I drive a car onto it and you'll see that it begins to bend. And if I drive a second car on, the whole thing bends rather alarmingly. And if a truck drove on, the whole lot would plunge to the bottom. And that's why he built a suspension bridge. And I'm building one here. Now you'll notice that the gap is actually wider than before. This was the original piece of roadway and we're about twice as wide. And I'm electing to use three pieces of roadway. And you'll see I've already suspended this half, so it's quite firm, but this half is flopped into the chasm. And so what I need to do is to anchor it with these cables or chains which go over the top of these towers and are then firmly fixed to the ground here. And I reckon that I can put my cars on here, drive them across, red first and then blue, and the bridge doesn't buckle at all. Well, there's a marginal bend, but it's only tiny. And you could drive very large, heavy cars across here without the whole thing plunging. And it's because the weight isn't all being borne just by little members. It's being carried through the tension in these cables over the towers to the anchor points behind. And that is how a suspension bridge works. Because it's a suspension bridge, it seems to be moving all the time. Well, it's almost as though it were alive. Anyway, the chap who knows more than anyone else about the bridge is the visitor services manager, Mike Rowland. Mike, is it really alive? Well, it behaves, certainly. The way I explain it to children is when they go to the adventure playground and they get on the wire bridge or the rope bridge that's there, as soon as they step on it, it moves. Yeah. But this one is just the same. It reacts to uh, load, yeah. when people come on it, and of course, weather. Yes. Uh, you can actually feel it just here. If you put your hand just in between the chains... Is that a good idea? There, yeah, well, I wouldn't advise you to do it when it's windy, but today it's okay. Just put your hand in there and you'll feel the chains moving against each other. Oh, hey! Hey! They're moving both sideways and up and down. I would think, yeah, you could lose a finger, couldn't you, if it was well, moving if it was much really more. Windy, yes, yes, it would. Yes. yes, that's brilliant. Thanks, Mike, very much. Cheers. Having come up with a solution to this problem, 250 feet above the water, he turned his engineering genius to another one, down below the surface. 
The floating harbour had solved Bristol's tidal problems, but the solution was creating a brand new problem. Time to call in Mr Brunel again. And Andy King. Andy, what did Brunel do? Well, Brunel was brought in to help solve the problem of silt. They'd slowed down the flow of water through the harbour by blocking it at both ends, which meant that all the mud that was in suspension in the water was dropping out as silt and filling the harbour up. The Very inconvenient. New... Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So Brunel was brought in to devise a way of getting rid of all that silt and to improve the harbour again. And what Brunel suggested was to tunnel underneath the dam and create sluices, which he called underfalls, to speed the water up as it flowed through the harbour and brought all the mud out with it and dumped it out into the new cut. Bristol's harbour was running smoothly once again. It continued to be a busy port throughout much of the 20th century. In World War II, it became a prime target for the Luftwaffe. Bristol was one of the most bombed British cities. Many of its oldest buildings, like Temple Church, were destroyed or ruined. It has a very special feature. Its tower leans at an alarming angle. This bit of ground here used to be a water meadow, known locally as Temple Meads, and that's why it's called Temple Church. And when they were building it, the whole ground sunk under half the foundation, so it was just built at an angle. There's a wartime story about Temple Church that spans the Atlantic and involves one of Hollywood's top film stars. Much of Bristol was being reduced to rubble. And meanwhile, the Liberty ships, which were bringing troops and stuff over from America, had to go back empty. And they didn't want to capsize, so they put lots of rubble in as ballast to keep them the right way up. And over-enthusiastic fire wardens took one look at this church and said, oh, we'll have to demolish that. It's obviously been damaged by bombs. And it was only at the last minute that the locals saved it from being knocked down. If, if that rubble had gone across there, it would have formed part of the foundations of the East River Highway in Manhattan, which was opened, for some reason I don't understand, 30 years later by Bristol's most famous Hollywood resident, Archie Leach, otherwise known as Cary Grant. He came out of retirement specially to open the highway. My being here specifically is because a great part of my family were wiped out in the war and in a particular air raid. And for all I know, I may be standing above their remains. Temple Meads is a name familiar to everyone who comes to Bristol. Not for the place where this ancient church stands, but as the terminus of another of Brunel's creations, the Great Western Railway. In 1840, the journey from Bristol to London would have taken at least 17 hours. That was all to change when, in 1833, a 27-year-old engineer called Isambard Kingdom Brunel was appointed to design and build the Great Western Railway, the London to Bristol line. The end of the line, or as Bristolians would have it, the beginning, was at Temple Meads Station. Either way, the railway marked the end of one thing, Bristol time. The town clock on the Corn Hall has two minute hands, and in the 1840s, one marked Bristol time and one railway time. Why the difference? Well, before UK time was standardised, Bristol was 11 minutes behind London, as it's more than 100 miles to the west. To avoid confusion, the whole line was run on Paddington time. By 1870, when the present station was built, the city had adopted Greenwich Mean Time, and Bristol time was no more. And that's why today the minute hands on the time clock are as one. Although actually you can still just see the two hands. All across Britain, the railway was cutting journey times dramatically. The first train journey between Paddington and Temple Meads in 1841 took just four hours. That's 13 hours quicker than the horse-drawn coach. But Brunel wasn't content to have his passengers go only from Paddington to Bristol, so he persuaded his backers to give him the money to build a huge wooden ship, the Great Western, 
so that the Great Western Railway would take them to Bristol and the ship would take them to New York and they could buy a ticket all the way from Paddington. The SS Great Western was a massive 250 foot long paddle steamer built in Bristol in 1837, the first designed for the Atlantic crossing. His net ship was even bigger. This is the SS Great Britain. In her day, by far the biggest ship in the world and still the biggest ship ever built in Bristol. She was made in this very dock where I am now, entirely of iron. All these plates here are iron and you can see the individual plates and where they've been riveted together. Here are the rivets and you can imagine hundreds of blokes with hammers walloping these rivets in. The noise down here must have been indescribable. And it wasn't just her size and iron hull that made her unique. Here in the middle of the ship is where everyone expected Brunel to put paddle wheels. There should have been one each side and they go round and round like this, driving the ship forward. But look, no paddle wheels. What he did instead was this. He used a screw propeller and look at the size of the thing. It's absolutely enormous. So the vast engine inside turned this great propeller round and round, pushing the water backwards. And this is far more efficient than the paddle wheels, which were flailing away at the surface. This was always under the surface, always pushing in the right direction. And it proved to be the new era in ship design. From this time on, all ships had propellers. And to drive this vast ship through the water with that screw propeller, he needed an engine, and this is it. And the way it worked was that down there, there are one, two, three, four huge cylinders. They're nine feet across. And there's a piston going up and down being driven by steam power. And the, pistons, the piston rods come up here and turn this crank. You see this enormous crank here. And it's going quite slowly. And you can't drive a ship with a propeller going round only, what, it's about three or four revolutions a minute. So then there's a huge chain wheel here. And on the end of it, you can see a vast chain. And this is going down to a much smaller chain wheel at the bottom. And it's gearing it up so the propeller shaft is moving several times faster than the engines. It's wonderful, it's terribly, terribly simple, but the biggest engine that had ever been built. But it wasn't just the technology that was amazing. The experience for the passengers was also really quite something. Nancy Chambers is development director here. Nancy, what was it like for the passengers? Well, it varied hugely depending on how much you paid. If you were first class, you would have the most sumptuous experience you can imagine. Queen Victoria came on board and was totally awed by what she saw. Oh, really? And they would have five, six, seven, eight course meals every evening in the fabulous dining saloon with the, the gilding and the mirrors and the plush carpets. By contrast, if you were in steerage or third class accommodation, you would be dining on ship's biscuits and, and <laughs> dried pork and that would be the sum of your, your dinner. Well, unlike most ships of the day, they actually built an ice house into the <laughs> ship to keep the meat fresh for the first class passengers. But that would only keep it fresh for 10 days. After that, they would be reliant on the animals that they had on board, uh, including cows, live pigs, animals. live animals, kept on top deck, the smell, the noise, you can just imagine. The SS Great Britain began her career as a transatlantic liner in 1845 and made her first crossing in under 15 days. She wasn't just fast. Because she was steam-powered, her journey time was predictable. In 1852, she began the second stage of her career, carrying emigrants to Australia. In the end, how many people went to Australia on this very ship? It was slightly over 15,000, but we've estimated that from those emigrants, as many as half a million modern-day Australians um, are, are descendants. Our grandsons and, uh, of, Absolutely. of the ship. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. In 1937, the SS Great Britain was abandoned off the Falkland Islands and left to rot. After 30 years as a passenger ship, she'd served another 60 as cargo vessel 
troop carrier and ultimately a sort of floating warehouse. It seemed an ignominious end for this once proud history-making ship. But it wasn't to be the end. 1970s saw her towed up the Avon to her birthplace, a glorious day for the Great Britain and Bristol. The beginning of her return to the fabulous ship we see again today. In the same year, another of Bristol's transatlantic icons was making the news. Concorde was the first passenger aircraft to travel at twice the speed of sound. The red, white and blue of Britain's supersonic jet giant was a proud sight as she made her 22-minute maiden flight to RAF Fairford, where the 10,000-foot runway, one of the longest in the country, waited invitingly for the Anglo-French superjet to return to Earth. Gracefully, like a prehistoric winged monster, 002 felt for the ground. Concorde was an Anglo-French venture, and the English Concords were built right here in this very hangar in Bristol. It was originally built for the Bristol Brabazon in 1947, and was then the largest hangar in the world. Wow! Today, the great hangars at Bristol's Fulton Works are working on another European collaboration, Airbus. Aeroplane production has been going on for almost 100 years in Bristol, since the British and Colonial Aeroplane Company was set up in 1910. Oliver Dearden is chairman of the Bristol Aero Collection. Tell me about the early days here. What have they made? In the very early days, in 1910, the very first aircraft they made was a Bristol box kite. And then in 1916, they got an order for the Bristol Fighter, which turned out to be one of the greatest fighters of the First World War. And then all the Bristol aircraft since then, the Blenheim, the Bullfighter, the, uh, the uh, Bullfoot, all the wartime aircraft, right. the Bristol Freighter, the Britannias, were all built in here. Oh, really? Yes, except they, final, they were finally assembled in, down in the Brabazon hangar. So a nation which once built its business on the mastery of great waters turns now to take up the challenge of the new trade routes of the sky. The 100-passenger Bristol Brabazon, specially designed to fly direct from London to New York, non-stop to the new world. It was after its time. It was built like a Queen Mary of the skies. <laughs> it had bedrooms, cinema, powder rooms. It never did fly to New York. It would, have, it would have taken 14 hours. So where did it fly if it never crossed the Atlantic? It, it, it flew from here, right. it did all its flying from Filton, it landed at Heathrow and it landed at Farnborough. Right. That's about that was all. it? Yeah. Oh, very sad. So it was a grand idea. That it was a grand idea. Just yes. many years That's but right. behind yes. its time. It, 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 yes, it was, yes. I don't think anyone would argue with the idea that Bristol's finest aeronautical achievement was Concorde. Her first commercial flights were in 1976, and she was the darling of the rich, the famous, and anyone else who could get on board for 30 years. Isn't this a most beautiful speedbird? Wow. Gosh, it's quite narrow. It's only about three inches wider than my shoulders and three inches taller than I am. I think I'll sit here. This looks like a, a good seat. Ah, oh, 1B. And I gather that when the Queen flew on Concord, she always had seat 1A here, her window seat. And if Prince Philip was coming too, he would have the window seat on the other side. But actually, it's so narrow, you could easily hold hands. There's no problem at all. And this also was the seat always booked by Joan Collins. And if her current husband was with her, he would sit here. And if he wasn't, she would have this seat too, so that nobody else could possibly sit next to her. And it's wonderfully comfortable. Soft leather. And you've got these nice armrests. Although, mind you, it's very narrow. But it doesn't really matter very much, because you're never going to be here for very long. You could fly to New York in about three hours. In fact, if you took off 
at 20 past 11 on Monday morning, you would actually arrive at 20 past 9 the same morning with the time difference. Extraordinary thing. The, the record flight time was from New York to London, two hours and 53 minutes. It was really exciting to go faster than the speed of sound because no other commercial aircraft has done that. And what people really wanted to see was getting up to twice the speed of sound. And this Mach meter here is gradually climbing and everyone rushed forward to take a picture when they got to the magic moment of Mach 2. And here we go. Ah, oh, it's there! Ah, twice the speed of sound! Fantastic! So, less than three hours for a journey that had taken Brunel's SS Great Britain 15 days and John Cabot's sailing ship the Matthew 54 days. The enormous Filton complex is on the outskirts of today's Bristol a vast urban area with a population of over half a million. Out to the west, it stretches to the sea and the docks at Avonmouth, a modern container port. But Bristol's old harbour is still the heart of the city, and a stroll along the harbour edge shows how it's changing with the times. There are no longer great ships unloading their cargoes from distant lands. This is water for recreation, not trade. Much of the industry fed by the docks has moved out or disappeared and Victorian warehouses are being converted to apartments or pulled down to make way for offices. Now there are new businesses providing the essentials of the present century. Tourism, recreation and entertainment are bringing life back to Bristol's harbourside. Art galleries, pubs, bars, restaurants, the SS Great Britain and the Matthew are reviving the heart of this vibrant city. Cheers. And Adam Hart Davis will be back next Monday night when he'll discover more about how Britain was built by visiting the northern port of Liverpool. After the break, Hidden House History will take us off to a farmhouse in Kent. <laughs>